Ladies and gentlemen, if I have your attention, please. My name is Dale Carpenter from uh, US EPA Region 2. I'll be your moderator for this panel. And we have a very lovely, talented, sharp panel this morning to talk about institutions and work that they've done with institutions and in trying to divert food from going to landfills, recover food, and reduce food waste. Um, I'm not going to read everyone's bios. They're in the panel, uh, they're in the program. So there's very interesting and uh, credentialed folks up here <laughs> who, who are going to speak this morning. So why is food so important? Well, you heard a little bit this morning about why it's so important. It's one of the largest portions of our waste stream in the United States. And really, there's no reason why organic should be going to landfills. Uh, you know, America's all about food. We love our food. We've got TV shows. We build palaces to food. You go to the grocery store, you can fit 747s inside these places. They're huge. And there's all kinds of choices. Unfortunately, a lot of that food goes to waste. Uh, food, and there's embedded resources in our food, right? 50% of our land use, 80% of our water use. There's environmental impacts from uh, in, in, uh, pesticides and fertilizers. And so we, there's a lot of impacts from food production in the United States. It's, uh, like I said, one of the largest portions of our waste stream, third largest a source of anthropogenic methane in the United States when it goes to landfills. So all of this is happening at the same time that 14% of our households in the United States are food insecure at some point during the year. <coughs> this panel has done a lot of work in this area in trying to solve some of these very serious <coughs> problems. And our first speaker today will be Nicole Savita, who is the director for the Food Recovery Project at Arkansas School of Law. They focus on, Nicole works to raise awareness on wasted food and the existence of hunger in the U.S. She has provided resources, legal resources, for businesses to support businesses in developing models, business models, to reduce food waste. So without any further ado, Nicole, if you could lead us off, that would be great. Sure thing. Wow, this room is packed. <laughs> really exciting. Um, before I get started, uh, I just want to ask you guys to give me a show of hands because I do this often. Um, I talk to all kinds of stakeholders about the legal environment around food waste and food recovery. Um, and today I was sort of planning to go a little bit kind of breeze through some of the urban stuff and go a little bit further than I usually get to, but I'm also seeing a lot of new faces in this particular room. Um, so how many people here are aware of the liability protections for food donation? Good! Excellent. Uh, how many people here don't need me to go into the details in depth about how that works? Good. Okay, we're going more time. Um, so that's how I started. I started this work and the Food Recovery Project at the University of Arkansas. Can you guys hear me? Great. At the University of Arkansas School of Law because we were trying to get grocery stores who had excess food. And I'm talking about like the really deteriorated stuff. The food that we could only put out for wildlife or maybe livestock. Um, to, to donate it during a drought when... Um, a program director was worried about the possums on her property. And <laughs> every grocery store in Northwest Arkansas that we approached said, no, it's illegal. Um, that was back in 2012. So we've made tremendous progress because had I walked into a room like this then, nobody would have raised their hand knowing about this little no 1996 law that created liability protection for food recovery. Um, since then, I've come to realize that although there is liability protection, which I will go over briefly, um, that there are other obstacles to actualizing that. And so I want to talk a little bit about how you navigate some of those obstacles and how large institutions 
can work together to create real connections and partnerships that help you work past those obstacles and move forward developing a robust food recovery program at a time when um, those policy ideas that someone was working on last night um, are starting to come forward and we're starting to really figure out how to do this right. So because we're in this transitional time, the relationship building between those who have excess food and those who have a way of utilizing that food in the highest and best way possible um, are working together. So that's really important to me right now. What does the Food Recovery Project do? We try to produce legal information in really plain language about how the law interacts with all of this extra food in our food system. We started by producing Food Recovery, a legal guide, that's floppy, um, which talks about the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act and lays out for anyone who needs to know exactly how you access that liability protection in detail. Breaks apart a very short statute into just a couple pages of actual English. Um, and so if you are trying to work with someone who thinks that this is illegal or is worried about legal risk, this is the document for you. We also get to work with these wonderful people at the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic. We did one on um, tax, the tax deduction. We did it once, then they improved it, we did it again, um, and so it's updated. And we are working on one right now that should be done any day now on uh, using um, food scraps as livestock feed and a 50 state survey of the law in all those areas. So that's what we try to do. Um, and when we're doing this work, we come up against people out there with food um, who just expect that this is going to be illegal. And it blows my mind that that's still happening. That people say, we can't do this because we're not allowed to. Um, let alone their risk aversion. And the balance of that risk, sort of the sense that, you know what, even if we're allowed to, we're probably gonna get sued at some point. So about every six months or so, I find a research associate, and I have them run the same search I ran a couple years ago, looking for cases, trying to see who's been sued and what is the magnitude here. This many, zero. Absolutely no cases of someone being sued for an illness, an injury, a death, <coughs> related to foodborne illness and donated food, slip and fall liability and collection of it. We've got nothing. In fact, that actually makes my job as someone who studies the law here kind of difficult and kind of really simple, right? Because lawyers like case law. We like to parse through it. We like to stand in rooms like this and talk about what the precedential value is. There's none. I've got no cases to go on. So um, the good news about that is that nobody's suing over this. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. Um, if you think about the dynamics, people don't really want to bite the hand that feeds them. Um, also, the people who are likely to get sick, it's always hard to trace foodborne illness when stuff gets aggregated, so you've got a defendant problem. And the people, unfortunately, who might get sick and if this is mishandled, don't have great access to justice. So there's a number of factors, both sort of positive and inherently negative, that play into this. But there's not a whole lot of legal risk here. There's also not a lot of reputational risk. And this is what I find even more interesting. I've run lots of searches for those nasty news media articles on those big, bad, terrible corporations that donated their food where someone somewhere along the line got sick. And there's not many of those either. In fact, although there are a couple of, mine did that this morning, so you're, you're, you're totally good with me. I, I need to apologize to Doug Brown. Um, okay, so the, the thing is, there have been a few times where there have been outbreaks associated with a meal served at a charitable feeding location with rescue to recover food. And each and every time, the coverage has been really measured. It talks about the number of people who were sick in and what maybe the source was. The, generally, the donors of the food have been protected by the recipient um, soup kitchen, charitable meal provider. Their, their name has not been dragged through the mud. And the relevant agencies do an investigation and figure out what went wrong. Often it's that there's a really good policy or procedure in place and someone screwed up time and temperature somewhere. They're one-offs. We're never going to have a completely 
foodborne illness free food system. Nobody ought to expect that. We're all trying our best. And when it gets a little, there's a little hiccup, generally the coverage is moderate. So there's not a lot of reputational risk either. Um, then the other barrier is just like the path of least resistance, right? It's always easiest just to dump it, not to think about it. Um, if someone wants you to put a program in place, well, it's easier to call whatever hauler is going to do bulk collection of compostables or who's going to do bulk collection of scraps to be utilized as livestock feed. If we're going to take the time to feed people, we need to do so in a way that is a, a lot more robust. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you all about the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act, but look for that guide if you need to know about it. Um, it really does provide protection to both the businesses who donate the food and the nonprofits that feed the hungry. And the really cool thing about this is that though it says donations must be made to a nonprofit organization, that does not have to be a registered 501 secret. So that's the thing people don't realize. Um, and persons is defined in the statute really broadly. So it can be anyone from an individual through a for profit business and nonprofit, it protects the directors. It's really broadly defined. Um, so what it doesn't protect <coughs> is a business handing out food directly to someone in need. So there needs to be some sort of intermediary in there, some sort of organization that's going to be responsible for handling it properly and doing the ultimate distribution. Um, this is the federal law. Every state has its own liability protection. Nobody can do less than this. Um, some do a lot more. In fact, I was doing this version of this lecture in Texas last year, and I found that um, while fed the federal law, federal protection requires that you comply with all quality and labeling standards imposed by federal, state, and local laws, Texas only requires substantial compliance, which actually helps a lot because it gives some wiggle room um, so that if there are small mistakes made, that's not like a hook for someone to try to really sue you. Um, it gets difficult. The tricks are in the cross-border stuff and the cross-jurisdictional stuff. So where do we really need to go to make progress? We need to get state and county departments of health involved in this conversation. And often they are the missing players. Um, we all really understand the power and the potential here. Um, they tend to be very, very risk averse. And sometimes they've got really good reasons and really good solutions. And sometimes I don't really see what they're so worried about. But if we could have more conversations that are supported by data that help us understand um, what it is we're really trying to control for with the people who are there making those rules, I think we'd make a lot of progress more quickly. But what I want you guys to think about is the fact that this is an investment in relationship building and sharing. Um, and just really, really quickly, I think about it, I started recently thinking about it, kind of like dating. Um, not food product dating, but dating. <laughs> the thing that either you're doing online, in an app, or at a bar, or maybe you're past and very glad to be done with. Um, but the steps are really similar. You first need to know yourself, right, if you're a potential donor. Know what you have to offer. Do an inventory. Then identify what kind of community partner would be your ideal match. What kind of infrastructure do they have to have, right? What do they need to do? Look at the scene. Don't necessarily start building a partnership with just the first organization that contacts you because they might not be the right fit. But do make that first move, right? Reach out. Start having those conversations. Explore what everybody's capacity is. Communicate really clear expectations about how much you're able to invest in this what you're able to do, and then make that first date plan, but be kind of specific. Start slow. Start with a pilot program between your organizations. Don't attempt to capture it all right away because it'll fall apart. <clears throat> then once you've got it underway, maybe start talking to your friends, and those friends can include your regulators. <laughs> you can start talking about what it is that you're trying to do here and how it's working and where you need their help. See what they think about it. Then take it to the next level and work through those tough times which you're asked to have. There's going to be a day when someone didn't miss the pickup or where everything falls out of temperature and what do you do with it? 
Uh, but work through those. Come up with contingency plans. Figure out how you're going to better train your personnel on both sides. How you're going to solve the transportation issues. Emerge stronger. And that's when you come out and tell the world. And you build a really strong campaign around what you're doing. And you will feel the love coming back in return. So um, it's a little tongue in cheek, but it is exactly what I've seen happen in the places where institutions and charitable food providers have worked together most successfully. And now I think you'll get to hear from some of the people who do that work. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much. That was that was awesome. Uh, by the way, we're gonna we're gonna hold questions until the end, and then we'll have a, a healthy Q and A session. So just hold your questions, and we'll go in order. Christy, Christy Cook is the director of sustainability, performance, and field support at Sodexo. I'm sure you've all heard of Sodexo, a large company that provides a variety of services, including food services. Uh, Christy's responsible for implementing, training, and measuring uh, progress of sustainability programs and corporate responsibility. <coughs> Christy. Thank you. Thank you so much. A um, couple of things. A disclaimer. I've added some videos. I don't know how it's going to work out. <laughs> okay, so bear with me just a little bit, but I'm trying to break it up a little bit. Um, just to show our hands, have you heard of Sodexo before? I'm just amazed, but I used to you get a couple of hands there, and now it's a lot more. So that's good. So that you know we're an institution. Um, <laughs> so that's good. Um, I'm going to talk about food recovery in a little bit different way this time. Um, instead of just the the donations, while we'll, we'll touch on that, I want to talk a little bit about how we approach food donations and why. And first off, um, back in oh, I'm going to get the date wrong. 1999, I believe, we started the Sodexo Foundation. And the foundation itself is a nonprofit that's really focused on um, hunger, specifically in children. And since then, we have um, provided 27 million in grants um, and funding for different projects. So I wanted to start off and talk mostly about the Sodexo Foundation today, the impact of the foundation, and then in some ways, how what that means at our sites. So first off, the, just to note too that um, you know, we do believe that food waste diversion, preventing, excuse me, preventing food waste is our first priority. And when we can't have that source reduction, it's all about the recovery side. So I'm gonna switch slides and see if this video plays. And I don't know if that's gonna happen. Um, but we're gonna give it a second. But talking about, again, our approach to growing people, our communities, and a movement. Did start. Have a space bar. Space bar. Space bar didn't work. Ooh. Next, next option. <laughs> space bar. Double click on it. Double click on it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. <laughs> In 96, there was this walk in Boston, and we did it with 17 uh, colleagues from uh, Sodexo. This walk was really the trigger to fight against hunger, the Sodexo Stop Hunger Movement. Hunger is unfortunately still a big problem in the world. The work is not done. So we engage in many, many communities. One of the objectives is to promote and develop leaders. During all these years, uh, we've seen so many do fantastic things uh, for their communities and developing their leadership skills and demonstrating the passion and enthusiasm that they had to serve their communities and make a difference in people's life. Thus far in the history of the Campus Kitchens Project, there's been two inflection points. One is 2001 when we started, and we started because of the support of the Sodexo Foundation. And the other was in 2013 when we knew we had an opportunity to expand exponentially the program and grow it nationally. The Sodexo Foundation was there again, mm -hmm. helping the network double in the last two years. We have to go beyond the meal. It's wonderful to collect unused surplus food, food that would go to waste. It's wonderful to turn that into meals, but what's going to happen next? The leadership development is providing a platform for the future, and we should all be hopeful for the future because of that. Excellent, thank you for that. I felt 
felt like that encompasses what I needed to say, and he was very succinct, so I didn't have to say it. So that was outstanding. But what I thought was awesome is this is a new video. I just saw it a week ago. And the fact that it said Boston in it, I was like, I've got to show you. This is awesome. So I wonder, what does this mean? Something huge for Sodexo started in 1996. Um, and it's grown so much. What are we in this room going to collectively do in the future that hopefully we can look back in years and be excited about? I'm excited about that. So um, one of the things that we did um, last June, we made a commitment to donate um, a million mills. And that, that uh, year has been up, and we, we made that uh, goal and exceeded it a bit. So we're quite proud about that, too. Um, we talked a lot about growing leaders. And um, this is an example of that, just focusing on our team members that are doing really great things in their communities, highlighting that, um, celebrating that, and encouraging that for others. And um, just to point this out, this is the foundation dinner that we do every year is one of the largest ways in which our Sodexo managers can be um, rewarded. They're there with our CEOs. It's just such great networking and career growth, professional development, and just uh, acceptance of the great work they're doing. And so that's exciting, too. Um, next one, I'm going to have one more video. Over the past 20 years, the Sodexo Stop Hunger movement has empowered hundreds of leaders to fight hunger in communities across the country, like here in Charleston, South Carolina. Katie's Crops began when I was in the third grade and I brought home a tiny cabbage seedling as a part of a school project. And soon it grew to be a 40 pound cabbage and my dad had always told me not to waste. So I thought it was a perfect fit to donate my cabbage to a soup kitchen so it could help to feed those families who might only get their only meal of the day from a soup kitchen. And I thought if one cabbage could feed 275 people, then imagine how many people an entire garden could feed. And this spring, we actually hit 100 gardens across the United States in over 35 states. And all of these gardens are grown by kids ages 9 to 16. And all of the produce from these gardens is donated to soup kitchens, homeless shelters, anyone in need in their communities. The Sodexo Foundation was actually one of the first organizations to really come behind Katie's Crops and support me. And I don't think I would be able to do any of this if it wasn't for their support so early on. Honestly, I have no idea how it grew to be so big. I Heart Hungry Kids is packing bags of food for hungry kids. We've grown immensely from our first packing party was 150 bags, and now we are at 1,500 bags. We started doing more and more, and the circle kept spreading to just thousands of bags of food and hundreds and hundreds of kids. We have delivered 86,500 meals for local kids in need. We have supporters all over the city, all because Jackson had an idea and said, I can do it. The Sodexo Foundation gave us our grant for our first packing party. Without them, we wouldn't have started. <laughs> We started a summer feeding program here at the Medical University of South Carolina. We call it Kids Eat Free at MUSC. What we were able to do was feed children while they were here on our campus at no cost to them. Within the USDA Southeast region, we're the very first hospital to do this. This year, we're really excited um, to expand the program into this beautiful uh, urban farm. This is the place where we're going to really start to capture those community members that would not have been here otherwise. Luckily, a year ago, uh, Sodexo intersected with I Heart Hungry Kids. <laughs> They're great at amassing massive amounts of volunteers that want to help. So they're going to supply our volunteer base for helping to distribute the meals out of this space. If we could replicate this at every hospital in the country, that's how we start to make a difference. 
It just makes sense for Sodexo to pair with I Heart Hungry Kids and Jackson is getting a monetary award for his education as well as a monetary award that will be donated to the charity of his choice. What's the charity of your choice? I Heart Hungry Kids. <laughs> There are 16,000 hungry kids in Charleston County that need our help, and our goal is to feed all of them. Whether it's your next door neighbor or the kids you go to school with, you may never know, but hunger is all around us. I believe this model of getting multiple partners around a central issue and each bringing our strengths is just going to help us really impact this problem of hunger in our community. A lot of looking at leaders, community impact, and growing the movement, but we also collaborate with a lot of other organizations. And um, you get to see some of the, the heroes, some of the, um, the youth that the, the, we call it, what is it, um, 20 ish something, the, the, the uh, 20 ish, under 20 ish kind of winners, but anyway. So, um, but anyway, some of our partners that you heard mentioned. Um, some you did not, and happy that we're here with some of them right now. Um, Food Recovery Network, obviously a lot of work there. Part of the founding of that organization was a Sodexo Foundation grant. Um, Feeding America, a lot of work with them as well, and part of it too that we do is a lot of culinary assistance, culinary training, training on how to uh, prepare foods that might be donated. And uh, we'll see, all the others were mentioned, but a couple of resources and, and great things happening in the Boston area. And I will now pass it on to Sasha. No, I pass it on Regina. to Regina. So before I pass it on, though, I have to mention, I kind of thought I was going to Sasha next. So just starting some work with them. So just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Up next, we have Regina. North House, who's the executive director at the uh, Food Recovery Network. And that's a student-based movement that is focused on recovering meals and donating food. So, Regina? Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, so usually whenever I give a presentation, I like to take a photo of the audience. So if you don't want to be in the photo and be on Twitter, um, just duck now. <laughs> Um, I basically do this because I want to um, talk, you know, show all those students, the thousands and thousands of students across our network, who you guys are. So thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see if I can do this. Um, Christy, like sh showing a video is like technologically way more advanced than <laughs> than I. So I'm gonna see if I can if I can do this. So, um, okay, so. Food Recovery Network started about five years ago um, by some college students at the University of Maryland. And since we are um, taking some surveys um, with the audience, um, how many of you are current students right now? Awesome. And how many of you have been to university? Which is pretty. Pretty fair assumption that most people have. Um, so the, the folks who started Food Recovery Network were students at UMD and <coughs> As we've all had this experience, you, you know, start to learn some really big issues that are facing <coughs> our country and our world. And in particular, you know, you learn things about food insecurity and climate change and poverty and um, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Um, <laughs> and we've we've all seen this statistic. Um, and you know, thank you to Emily and, and her team. Um, for really supporting us and understanding um, really what our food waste looks like in this country. Um, so, you know, another really, really big issue that um, our students um, realized we could do something about this. So, you know, here we are, we make all this amazing food, um, we make enough food in this country um, and waste enough food that fills the Rose Bowl twice, so that big stadium that I just showed. We fill that every day twice with, with food that could be given to people. Um, so I actually don't really know football that well, so I, I looked up the Rose Bowl um, just to you know, get a sense of what you know, volume um, is. And it's, it's the 18th largest 
um, stadium in, in this country. So it's, it's pretty huge. And I think you know, we're all here today and for this conference because we know that we can do something different. Um, you know, another very big statistic that we all hear about one in six, and sometimes one in seven of our neighbors who are food insecure don't know where the next meal is coming from. Um, so these students at University of Maryland learning about all these huge problems. They know that you know their neighbors, some of their classmates uh, were food insecure. Um, and as they were growing up in their community as college students in this unique environment, um, a couple of them were you know interning at a place called um, Health Leads. I don't know if you guys have heard of that or not, but it's basically a wraparound nonprofit that supports people um, in their whatever needs that they might have if they are um, living in poverty. And so one of our co-founders, um, she had an internship there, and one of the clients who came in um, needed uh, support on, I think it was housing, um, and mentioned, you know, I actually don't have a lot of food, um, you know, at my house right now. Can you do something about it? And so here she is saying, I, I actually can't. I, I really, I can't help you with with that issue. Um, and then literally um, took transportation to go back to UMD where she also um, had a second job um, working at a pizza line. So and this is the actual pizza line at, at UMD. And it's one of those you know, gourmet um, pizza, pizza lines. And at the end of the night, at the end of her shift, they threw away like seven pizzas. And you know, it just started to come together like, wait, hunger people, and I literally just had to throw away food. Um, and so that was the, the beginning of the journey of Food Recovery Network. And again, you know, thanks to Sodexo, um, we were able to get a, a seed grant a few years ago to get us up and running. So mind you, these are still college students, right? So they're, they, they have some space at UMD, um, they get a little bit of office space, and they just start, um, um, here's some pictures of some of the food that we recover. And I can walk you through the process really quickly of what, of what we do, because it does touch upon a lot of what Nicole was talking about with um, people who are afraid of um, donating um, surplus food food. Um, um, so what they did was they, um, at UMD, they basically called up a friend, and he's, he's here today, in fact, at Brown University, his name is Ben Chesler. Um, he's here at the subsequent um, uh, panel that, you know, you guys, thanks for choosing this one. But he's over there <laughs> representing another organization. Um, they called up Ben and said, hey, we're, we're going to do this thing. Can you, you want to join us? And he said, sure, great, okay. What, what is it? <laughs> what are you guys doing? Um, and so basically what uh, the students did was they realized you know, all this really great food at UMD is being thrown away. So they approached a woman named Colleen Wright Riva, the dining manager there. And she's actually still very active with us today. I owe her an email, in fact. Um, and they said, um, Colleen, can we take the food that you know, isn't purchased at the end of the night um, and you know, bring it to a, a church down the street? And she, like many of the dining service managers, not out of anything nefarious, um, but just out of being scared, said, no, <laughs> absolutely not. You cannot do that. And um, the one thing that I do love about um, the folks who started this, um, who started Food Recovery Network and the thousands of students who are in our network today, they didn't take no for an answer. They kept basically bugging her, <laughs> Colleen, every day. Colleen, we can do this. Just give us a shot. We know we can do this. And eventually she said, okay. Um, and so that night, they, at the end of uh, the meal, they wrapped up all of the surplus food and they took it to um, one of our hunger fighting partner agencies not too far away. And that was one night, you know, they had a, um, about 100 pounds of food. And then they kept doing it week after week and they amassed thousands and thousands of pounds of food. So then they realized we're onto something, called up Ben, then they called up their friends um, in Pomona in California, and then they kept calling up their friends. And then Sodexo, much like we heard, um, stepped in and said, okay, you guys do have something, and we're here to help support you to scale. And that's what we've been doing ever since. Um, it's been an incredible journey, and if you think about Food Recovery Network, it's about to turn five years old. Again, you know, just as we've heard today, that landscape was so different five years ago. And people didn't know about the Bill Emerson Act. Um, people didn't know that you could donate food, especially on college campuses. And now today, <coughs> look at what we're all doing. It's, it's just really incredible. Um, and really quickly, I, I will just talk through the model because we are driven by students. And in fact, 
Um, in Massachusetts, we have um, 10 schools in the area that have um, FRN chapters. So I'm really excited. And you know that I'm going to ask each and every one of you where you went to school. Because we'll need to check to make sure that you have a chapter. If you don't, I, I have a team that can help make that happen. So. <laughs> um, so it's driven by the students. The students are the engine. They're the ones who said, we can do something different and better with our surplus food. And that results in a win for those in need. So for our food insecure neighbors. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but maybe some of you grew up food insecure. I know that my mom did, and it definitely impacted her and how she raised my sister and me, where we basically maybe became part of the problem where we had so much food because of how much that, that impacted her growing up. So it doesn't it doesn't leave you, you know, and we're all one step away from you know something like that happening. So it helps all of us. It supports all of us. Um, and then the student leaders. Now I, I love the, the college experience. I actually went to a commuter school so I didn't have like the dorm life experience but I had other really wonderful experiences. But you know being in college is, is a really unique situation like I mentioned. And oftentimes, you know, you, you think about some of our institutions and people say that, you know, the students live in a bubble. They live in a bubble where they don't have to face any problems, where everything is just handed to them while they're learning. And I don't know if I agree with that because, again, I can point to about thousands and thousands of college students who say, you know what, I want to actually go out into my community and I want to make a difference and I want to meet the people. Um, that live so close to me. So our student leaders are the ones who, who drive that. And so not only are they going out into the community to meet people, but like I said, you know, flash forward about five years ago when they had that really difficult conversation with, with Colleen, they're doing that today. You know, we have so many chapters that just started this year. Um, and as we are able to educate um, more and more of our dining services, and again, with Sodexo, I mean, they just get it at the, at the very top. You know, they just get it. Um, it, it makes that process um, that much easier. But these students are basically running um, their own program all across the country, recruiting volunteers, managing a leadership team. It's really incredible. And, and they're not just folks who are interested in, in food. We have engineers, we have English majors, we have people from all different backgrounds who just want to do something different and better. And then our communities. You know, what I was saying about our, um, we, we have over, almost 400 um, hunger fighting partner agencies that we talk with uh, uh, at any given day. It's really amazing. Some of our students now, not only are they recovering food and bringing it to um, different um, organizations, but uh, for example, one of our students, um, they, they bring, the chapter brings their food um, to an after school program that has a, a dance component to it, to teach little kids how to dance. And um, our FRN leader, he knows how to dance. So he started volunteering <laughs> to teach you know, the little kids how to dance, which I think is, is wonderful. So they just have so much to give, and as do our communities. And then we do talk about, you know, we want it to be easy for businesses to do the right thing. And we've heard about the tax incentives. Um, we've heard about, you know, on our end, with, this is Nick um, from Chickensburg. He um, says, you know, when I give away um, my surplus food, I literally have less waste to haul away. So I'm saving money there. And you know, what a better state to be in than, than Massachusetts that says, yeah, absolutely, you're not putting you know, perfectly good food in the trash. Um, and so this is just an example of, you know, truly there is, at, when you reduce food waste at the source, and when you give away your surplus good food, there's just a lot of impact that you can make. So flash forward, 2013, um, you know, the, the students, when they first started FRN, they had, um, they had a, a goal to be on you know, 25 campuses you know, by, by 2013. They far out, out to pass that. Um, they were on over 70 by the time 2013 hit. 2014, they were surpassed 100. Um, and then today, actually, um, I'm really proud to say that we're, we're actually at almost 200 college campuses across the country, um, and we're literally growing every day. And with your help, all of you, um, if your school is represented, we're going to continue to grow and to scale. Um, and I'm really proud to say that in November, we hit 1 million pounds of food that we recovered. Um, it was a huge milestone for us, you know, being driven by students. And, and today, we're at um, almost 1.4 million pounds of food. So can't wait to celebrate with all of you when we get that 2 million pounds of food. Um, 
So again, the student effect. It is the millennial generation and the Z generation, I just heard about you guys, <laughs> that are changing you know, behavior. Um, this is the amount of food the average family wastes in this country. And again, our students are saying, let us do something different and let us do something better with that, that supposed food. And so for us, what's next? Um, you guys are a big part of that conversation. Um, we are, we love to collaborate and we love big ideas. And I know that there's some really amazing people in this room. Um, so I want to just make sure that we're in touch. And I really look forward to getting our country where our, our big goal, you know, at Food Recovery Network, our, our big goal is that every single college and university in this country, <coughs> higher education is the first sector where food recovery is the norm and not the expectation. Um, so with your help, I know that we can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regina. And our final panelist uh, is going to be Sasha Kapura. She's the executive director at Food for Free. Uh, been around since 1981, I understand. Sure. And uh, they focus on food rescue and food donation. Thank you. Um, so, one thing I just, uh, many of you may be aware of this, but hunger in our country is really less often a lack of access to food and more often a lack of access to nutritious food. So when you're thinking about food recovery and donating to people, it's an important thing to understand because if you have $4, I had a slide in another slide set that showed for $4 this huge Burger King meal with mm -hmm. you know, a burger with lots of burgers on it and fries and some side thing and a big Coke. And then at uh, Market Basket, which is a, one of the less expensive supermarkets here, it was a head of lettuce and a tomato. <coughs> and if your kids are hungry and if you're hungry, and you only have $4 to spend, it, you have some really difficult decisions to make. So one of the things that Food for Free does focus on in all of the work that we do is dealing with healthy, nutritious foods. And so we aren't able to rescue, or we, we choose not to rescue from any organization, which is unfortunate because food waste by itself is a challenge. But our organization, a lot of the food rescue organizations we work with in this area, it's really important that we're trying to capture as much healthy food as we can. We're not trying to deny, you know, if we go to Whole Foods and there's a chocolate cake, we'll take it and we'll give it and somebody will be very happy for it. But we try to supplement that with a lot of produce, a lot of proteins, etc. So Food for Free has been fighting hunger since 1981. Hunger being really a lack of access to nutritious food. And we have a lot of programs. We have our Cambridge Weekend Backpack Program, which sends kids home with backpacks of food for them and their siblings on the weekends because kids, low-income children, rely heavily on schools to eat well. We have a home delivery program where twice a month we bring boxes of groceries with a lot of produce to homebound, disabled, or seniors living in Cambridge. So we're based in Cambridge, this is the city right here. We have a small farm in Lincoln where we're growing organic produce that we distribute to the emergency food system. I'm going to talk a bit more about our family meals program, which is very exciting. I'm sure you'll agree when you see it. But this is bringing healthy microwaveable meals to individuals who have barriers to cooking for themselves. <coughs> And then we do food transportation for our partners. But the core of what we do is food rescue, which is why we're here today. Um, I'm not going to tell you that yet. So in 1981, we became the nation's first food rescue organization. We pick up from all the Whole Foods and Trader Joe's in the area, have been doing it since they've existed, from wholesalers. We go in the summers to 11 farmers markets. We work closely with the Boston area gleaners who are in one of these other rooms talking about farm gleaning. Uh, we actually pick up from the daily table and distribute to the daily table. We then work with 100 plus partner agencies throughout 12 greater Boston cities, food pantries, shelters, meal programs, food programs, anybody that's serving a low income population. So it may be a food based program, but it may be a program that's trying to educate children. And if they're hungry, it's hard to educate children. So we will distribute to any organization that is primarily serving low income populations. In the last year alone, we distributed the equivalent of about 100, about 100, about one and a half million meals, that's about two million pounds of food, to over 30,000 people in 12 greater Boston cities. So as I mentioned, um, in 1981, we became the first food rescue organization. So we were talking about five years ago, and, and I've only been with Food for Free for four years, but 
back then, nobody, I mean, we just, it was Cambridge, and this is what happens in Cambridge. People saw <laughs> food getting thrown out, and they saw hungry people, and they borrowed a van, and they picked it up, and they distributed it. Uh, we're all here today, and so we know that now there are hundreds, um, and that doesn't even cover, this is, this doesn't even cover all the, the uh, food yeah. recovery yeah. network sites, so that's not an actual map. But the reality is it's become incredibly popular, and we're all here today. Now I want to talk about sort of what's next for us, which I'm really excited about. Um, we are moving into prepared food at a fairly, well, ideally at a large scale over time. We are polyamorous, so we are dating yeah. many <laughs> <laughs> um, But currently, from a prepared food standpoint, we are working with Harvard, uh, MIT, Google, and, and everybody listed here. So for the last 35 years, it's primarily groceries, items that you can put in a grocery bag, go home, and cook. Prepared food, as you know, is prepared food. There are challenges in scaling up prepared food donation. It is fairly easy to do at a small scale, but we started working with Harvard University in November of 2014, and in the fall when we rolled out all the dining halls, we were picking up about 2,500 pounds, the equivalent of about 2,000 meals, of these big frozen bags of food left over from their 14 dining halls. And Harvard has high standards of food. It was good food. We had to check that before we did it. It certainly was. But it's challenging, very impractical to hand a bag of frozen mashed potatoes to a family. Over the last year, though, we have invested in figuring out how do we take that food while it's still frozen, break it down, and portion it. Um, Chrissy, I would point, I don't want to hurt her eyes, but she's sitting up there, and, and Ross is also up there, have figured out this process of creating family meals. So this is leftover Harvard and Tufts food, and it's frozen. It hasn't been unfrozen. It's in a very convenient container. I would eat that. It is beautiful. It is healthy. It is well portioned. We're delivering right now 400 of those meals each week to families that are sheltered in a motel in Brighton. So these are families who don't have homes, and they have maybe two kids, and they have a microwave, and they have a bathroom sink. And imagine, and there's a McDonald's next door, and there's a Chinese food restaurant downstairs. How can you eat healthily when that's going on? So we are really excited about this possibly being uh, the way to do it. Over the next several months, we are perfecting our family meals process. We're using our kitchen space, we're using volunteers. We're figuring out how do we scale this up at a low cost? And how can we create a model that others can replicate so that map is also full of organizations taking advantage of, at scale, this massive amounts of prepared food that is, um, would all be going to waste if it weren't for organizations like the Food Recovery Network and Food for Free. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. You finished ahead of time. That's, that's pretty impressive. Sorry. <laughs> I can get back up, but I think I have to say. <laughs> So, I believe at this point, you can start our... Uh, <laughs> You've got to take it. <laughs> I, I don't need the microphone. That's okay. No? Okay. Um, Sasha, I am wondering, so you, I'm just wondering about logistics. I'm, yeah. I work for the Vermont Food Bank. Very interested in moving into prepared foods and, you know, we work a lot with mostly, I should say, groceries, food mm -hmm. donations and yeah. other things like that. And I don't know how to take, well, first of all, I don't really understand the circumstances under which that large, huge bag of frozen mashed, mashed potatoes is available in the first place. Yep. So what makes that available for donation, one? And then two, do you break it down? Where do you break it down? Okay. How do you break it down? Details. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> um, in 2014, we'd been picking up at Whole Foods since they existed in Cambridge, and, at 20, and it was primarily grocery. And in 2014, I get a call from one of my drivers, uh, and He's like, Sasha, we've got these big bags of frozen food. And I think that same day or later that day, I also got a call from Steve Dietz from Food Donation Connection, who's in that room, saying, hey, by the way, um, they came up and started working with Whole Foods. Food Donation Connection is an organization that helps with prepared food donation for the last 24 years. And so immediately, I understood there's this thing I didn't know we could do in a health-safe manner. And we brought him into Harvard University and said, tell Harvard, because Harvard wants to work with us. So we all sat down, because, and I didn't know at this point how does it all work. And basically, they've got, um, they've got 14 dining halls. They're serving, it's something like 158,000 meals a week. 
And if you think about your own Thanksgiving dinner, you do not want anybody scooping up the last little scoop of mashed potatoes because it suggests there might not have been enough. They have students paying for dining hall plans, so they ha and they have buffet style serving, and so they need to have enough for everybody. That food gets put out in things, <laughs> things being metal trays most likely. Um, if it's plated to a student's plate and they don't finish it, it goes to waste. But there are different regulations about how long food can be at a certain temperature. A lot of that stuff's still out there. The stuff in the Whole Foods hot bar that went out in the last hour is still donatable. So they basically take it and they put it into food safe plastic bags instead of into a trash can or compost, which is what Harvard was doing and, and Whole Foods. And they immediately put it on a tray into a freezer to bring it down to temperature in a food safe manner. So that's why you get big frozen bags of food. Um, then we pick it up. We go by Harvard dining halls, depending on the size of them, between three and five times a week to pick up the food that they have. So they keep it in their freezers. We come with boxes, we put it in our freezer, and then it moves into our family meals process. The family meals process, so initially we found some soup kitchens that, there was one in Lowell. We had to have somebody come from Lowell once a week to pick up 1,500 pounds because they were serving 500 meals a day to homeless or recently homeless, and it they really helped their budget. They come took these big bags and they had a setup where they could then just reheat it and serve it to people. But there's not a lot of organizations that big, particularly in this area. There's a lot of very small organizations. So we went out and looked at what's going on out there. This organization, Bread of Life, was taking a bunch of it, defrosting it, putting it into styrofoam containers and bringing it to some folks in a motel in, in Malden, a, a city nearby. And that was great, but it was one meal and it, it was hard to, it, it's reheating food once you defrosted it or refreezing it, it's not so good. So right now we're borrowing kitchen space from a church in Harvard Square. Uh, we use primarily volunteers. Ross and Chrissy, who will give you all the details after, have learned what you can break down, what you can't break down, when do you need a chisel, when do your hands work. I mean, they're surf safe certified, there's gloves, there's hats, there's safety, but you put a bunch of frozen peas in a, in a, um, Words are escaping me today, but uh, another metal bowl, and you, some of this you can just do with your hands. And then we lease this machine for free, we pay for the packaging, we portion it out, vegetables, starch, protein, and we seal them. And they go in a freezer, and then you can maintain these for a period of time, distribute them in bulk, uh, the, the options open up tremendously. I would say um, a couple of points and then I'll get you know I think where we challenge a lot is in hospitals um, government services typically locations there's a lot of security um, issues to deal with but in the K through 12 schools is quite interesting um, one of the things that um, I really enjoyed about some of the K through 12 work is mostly uh, we've partnered with the EPA in a couple of regions and done some waste characterization audits and we've done it in a way where um, we go through and we see what is being wasted or you know what's going to go to the landfill essentially and look at those products we also pair that with some um, like like fifth graders interviewing kindergartners and first graders asking them what did you not like why didn't you like that why didn't you eat that what did you waste those kind of questions and basically what's happened is it's informed us on a couple of things um, one example is um, there was a student that um, didn't eat his carrots one day so the fifth grader is asking him why didn't you eat your carrots and the student says well, I don't like carrots and um, they got more into the conversation and there's a vegetable bar that student selected those carrots like to waste them I guess because mom says I should eat a vegetable and I chose the carrots so there's some things like that that we found <coughs> we've also found that um, something else that's happening in the K through K through 12 market is um, their lunch periods are getting shorter in a lot of areas that creates a rush um, if PE is after lunch, the students don't eat as much because they want to go outside and play. And then you hit that afternoon lag where they don't learn, learn as much, they don't retain as much, and they're just exhausted. So there are some infrastructure things potentially that, that might be types of solutions, but those are a couple of things that we're seeing um, in that, that specific area. 
Yes, I can tell you, uh, uh, Christy, from having worked with schools myself, that there's a lot of challenges in working with schools, especially, like you said, the lunch times are getting so short now. These kids are, are eating in, in a big rush. It's a, it's a big problem. Yes, sir. Uh, question on recruiting food donors. Actually, two questions, I guess, for Sasha and maybe for Regina as well. Um, the first question is, what is your approach to recruiting food donors and your strategy, who does it? And a very specific question, what are the key objections you find when approaching them and how do you overcome them? This has been a significant learning curve for Food for Free because when I went to Harvard, it was like that. Harvard was already ready and committed to doing this. So I sat down with them and we had an agreement within a week. So I thought, this is easy, right? Uh, it's not. It, and, it, and it varies from organization to organization. And so we've tried, I have no specific, here's what we do, but some of the things that we've tried. One thing that's been really effective is Harvard then, they're incredible partners. And they have reached out to the dining hall network and helped get us Tufts. Um, we got MIT through Spoiler Alert, who is another group here. They're Bon Appetit. Bon Appetit is another food service provider. And then Bon Appetit connected us to Emmanuel College that is also Bon Appetit. It's so the successful piece has primarily been through word of mouth and recommendations. We are now trying to use media and, and use names, right? So we have Harvard, we have Google. We just wanted to move into the corporate. Um, so it's, it's difficult because I don't have a prospecting team or a sales team or any of that. Mm -hmm. And when you go into a Harvard who owns their dining hall services, easy. They're all report into to David sitting at the end of the table. And then you go to MIT who was willing, but you have Bon Appetit, you have MIT. Uh, MIT pays for waste hauling. Bon Appetit doesn't care if we're saving costs on waste hauling. There's all of a sudden just different incentives. So haven't, you know, it's different so far in each of the organizations. But the, and so then in terms of the barriers we run into, it totally depends. If we find an organization that cares like Harvard, we just, it is who are you dealing with? It isn't even, is it Bon Appetit or is it Harvard? Who's that individual in there and do they care? And if there's somebody in there that cares, it's amazing how quick and easy it goes. Tufts, strangely, for the first year when I kept trying to reach out, I'm hearing back and maybe I'm talking to the wrong people, we don't have any food waste, right? So some people it's hard to acknowledge. <laughs> to flip that around, Tufts is now not only giving us their food donations, they're freezing it in individual portion sizes, making it easier for Ross and Chris to repackage. And next year they're gonna work with students on campus to actually do the repackaging before it gets frozen. So it's who are you dealing with? Um, liability is at, uh, the, the school that we're sitting at now is we're, we're working with them, they want to do it, but they're, they're lawyers and they're concerned about not just liability but sued and they know which, what lawyers can accomplish. So, you know, not a straight answer, but it's a lot of different things. It's personality based. Cambridge, Boston area, it's, it's rarely a lack of knowledge. There's so much going on here. I would I would just chime in really quickly too about how how we recover or recover how we recover volunteers <laughs> recruit volunteers <laughs> it's and I, I think for me the the approach that I would take with that um, response is that you know we're in a movement and so we're movement builders and um, you know we're trying to change people's behavior and we're using this next generation of emerging leaders to do that behavior change. And my, my background is in individual leadership development. And so, and again, when you think about this really huge problem of food waste, um, it's all individuals who are solving that problem. And for me, it's like, how well are we working together to achieve a, a common goal? And so our students, again, are the drivers. So they are the ones who are recruiting their friends, um, you know, doing, using their, their lift servers across, across their campuses to recruit folks. And then we get into the common problems of, you know, um, XYZ person said that they're going to come and, and do a recovery and they don't show up or, you know, so there's a lot of that. And so my job and what we do at the national office is to support people in having those difficult conversations around, you know, holding people accountable. How can we make this fun for um, volunteers? What trainings and resources do you guys need so that you're the best that, that you can be? And it's really exciting um, in that way. So. Yes, I started a food rescue uh, program in Andover, north of Massachusetts, in the elementary school level, and it's expanding to different towns. Uh, two things. The national healthy lunch that the kids are having in elementary school or middle school, they're forced to have in all these different uh, ingredients, so that's why 
they're trashing 90% of what they take in the tray because they have to take it and they have no stool, they are not hungry, they have PE, so mm -hmm. that's a lot of the ways. But that's not what we can recover at the limit. What we recover is all the unopened and peel and untouched milks, yogurt, cheese sticks. Yeah. So that seems to be a little easier to recover mm -hmm. and donate than meals that are already prepared. I don't see a big trend going on in a lot of schools to educate kids and teachers to actually recover all those items. Uh, Vermont and Indiana already passed a national guidelines to force the schools to donate all that. Hopefully Massachusetts follows the same trend. I know New York is in the state level. Uh, they're trying to pass that bill. Do you see any trend, hopefully, going on in all the schools? Yeah, I actually, I'm, I'm part of a working group in D.C. to just get our arms around how much food waste we have. Um, you know, D.C. is, um, we have a lot of urban farms there and a lot of schools. And so, there, you know, just how much food do we produce in this one city and how much of that food are we wasting? And I was actually just talking to somebody on the working group same exact situation where why are we forcing little kids to drink milk? Like, I don't get it, first of all. But um, so same same problem, exactly as you mentioned. And so they have um, a program that's basically a swap out program. So if you don't want your milk or if you don't want your apple, right then you can just you know, put it in a bin and um, sharing tables. a sharing table. Yeah. Exactly. And it seems to be working you know, really well. And I always say too, you know, exactly as you mentioned, loose teeth and whatnot, we give kids these huge apples. Um, I, I know other folks who are starting to, to cut up fruit um, so that it's more manageable, you know, if you have braces. <laughs> so, you know, you're trying to look cool when you're eating food, um, it's really hard. So things like that, I, I, I have heard some, some rumblings, positive rumblings. Thank you very much. Yes? I just wanted to add to that, um, I'm working in my schools here. I'm with the University of Arkansas. Happy holidays. Thank you. So I'm working with the USDA and the EPA on writing a, a national K-12 food waste audit guide for schools to use, mm -hmm. as opposed to consumer guide that takes into account some of the behavioral economics of slicing the apples, recess before, after lunch, and how that factors. But uh, one of the, is anybody from the USDA here? Okay, I'm going to publicly represent. <laughs> um, so part of part of it is is that that's a missing voice in this conversation, and um, what we're finding in our surveys and in our research is that um, the policy exists to correct the record, so to speak, in that uh, milk is not mandatory. That is a misconception. It's not supported by statute. It's not supported. It's a it's an inherited legacy. Milk was mandatory in the week. With the Healthy Niagara Free Kids Act of 2010, milk is not made. Milk is optional. And so this is a policy education piece. So waste reduction begins with policy education. And that, that's a huge factor. So in our food waste audit research, um, I audited six schools for a week at a time each. And I went in looking to see to what extent these kids are throwing away all these healthy fruits and vegetables because it's just a it's child seed. They're really not. What they're throwing away is milk. And so that's policy adjustment that's easily achievable with education and outreach. And so um, I think that that's where we're, we're heading into looking at those combinations of education and um, the national umbrella message of bringing people up to speed with current uh, regulations and guidelines, um, as well as um, using the national, this national template for food waste audits in the K 12 environment so that we all are using. We're singing from the same hymnal, but then we also have a place to put our data um, on a national uh, spreadsheet with the USDA so that we can, can begin to see things that we don't know that we're not seeing. So like I said, I went in to look at to what extent fruits and vegetables were being wasted, and then I ended up finding and pivoting my entire <laughs> research towards milk because it has a much higher carbon footprint, methane footprint, and uh, the environmental factors within K-12 food waste are Exponential, especially in the, um, as a program at the uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a, a very important point, and I know EPA, at least in Region Two, has been reaching out to USDA and having conversations. Yes, about so we're that. jointly publishing. This is the University of Arkansas EPA and the USDA. Thank you very much. Yes. Christy, 
I didn't like your competitors are doing the same thing as Sodexo's foundation, and if not, is Sodexo reaching out to them to help them do something similar? As part of the foundation, I, I'm not aware of any other organizations that have a foundation similar to Sodexo. However, we are on uh, similar working groups, panels, <coughs> and do share best, best practices. and. Quite honestly, it's a competition in some ways. Like we learn something that somebody else is doing. Oh, well, if you're doing that, I can do that and vice versa. So there is some collaboration, um, even in industry. Um, if I'm at a conference and you know I, I get approached, oh, Sedex is not doing this here. Can you do that? Um, my colleagues and counterparts in the other organizations reach out to me and I do the same for them. So there is a, there's not a formal process, but there's definitely an, a common goal in which we try to help each other out for those types of things. Thank you. We're, we're almost out of time, folks, uh, and you've got a very short lunch hour, so I don't want to cut into that too much. We've got one more question. Sorry, I know. Second one. And so with all three sectors represented up here, right? So you have the food recovery side. I'm, I've been going under the impression that I actually can't take the food that's on the buffet line. So, and that might be a separate question for Feeding America, but um, legally, is there a legal precedence of anything coming out? I know you talked about some of the other things. There's no legal precedent of anybody being sued or you know any brand recognition, anybody being dragged through the mud. So I guess I'm wondering about buffet line specifically, if there's anything that I need to know. And then also I'm wondering about Sodexo. As you sort of move toward these goals that you've been creating and, and just supporting, you know, food waste recovery, is Sodexo encouraging all of your institutions in such a large organization to do that kind of food recovery from the buffet? So just from a legal standpoint, you just hit where the weeds come in, right? Like now we're in the weeds of what can you do in your jurisdiction, um, and that is because the biggest barrier to widespread food recovery is trying to get some sort of uniform health and safety guidance or rules. Um, and there's a lot of ways we could go about it. We could get the FDA involved. The EPA is here. The USDA is here. Where is the FDA? He was here. here. Excellent. Well, that's the first time. So congratulations. I'm super glad about that. Um, it's, been, it's been a long time coming to try to get them into the conversation and get them involved in um, figuring out a way to create some uniform guidance so that the department, even though they may not have regulatory authority, um, so that there's something for state and county departments of health to go on um, and we can start creating some uniformity around this. It is very rare that it's more dangerous to recover food from a buffet in Tennessee than it is in Massachusetts. Alaska, Massachusetts, yeah. anywhere else. Yeah. But like, there's substantial, substantial variability once we get down into the weeds on that. So if we could start coming up with some really good standards-based um, uniform regulations, we could take the models that are working really well in one place and very easily export them to the other. But for now, unfortunately, the thing I always have to say to people is you've got to go talk to your local regulators and figure out what is the universe of the possible where you're located. Where are you? Vermont. Oh, thank you. you can do it. Progress being made. There's a there's no one in the state of Vermont serves more meals than Sodexo, actually. Um, speaking of Sodexo in, in Vermont, but um, so what we ask of every single one of our operations is to please donate food where possible. Does it happen in 100% of those? It does not. Um, and the reason, a lot of reasons that that come up are, are, are things that we've always talked about. But the advice I would give. Everyone in this room is lead with yes. You know what, I'm tired of the conversations that, you know, oh, we can't do it because of this. Let's stop that for just a second. Let's talk about we can do this. Now, what do we need to do? What do we need to overcome in order to do this instead of approaching it from the negative? So that's, that's kind of how I have handled those conversations when, you know, we have a location who's not donating. And sometimes there are barriers. Um, government, I mentioned a couple of those that it's extremely difficult from security standpoint to, to have a lot of people in and out of a location, but um, oftentimes there are solutions. Build it into your contract with your food service provider. Yes. Let them do it in the contract. Negotiate yes. for food recovery. Yes, that's perfect. exactly, exactly. Unfortunately, folks, that's all the time we have for questions.